In this video we're going to cover these following three topics, counting elements in finite sets, product sets, and partitions of sets. When we're counting uh, elements of a set, in this case we're talking about finite sets, so there's a finite number of elements in, these, in the sets that we're dealing with here. There's uh, different situations when we're counting elements. First, let's look at disjoint sets. We have two sets, A and B, and they're disjoint. Each one of them has a certain number of elements in them. If we want to know what the number of elements is in the union of those two, then remember the union includes, in this case for disjoint sets, all the elements of A and all the elements of B in the set. And therefore the number of elements in A union B will just be equal to the number of elements in A plus the number of elements in B. Now I'll give a real quick example here. These are two just disjoint sets under, uh, here listed. A, which contains 2, 7, 8, and 12, and the set B, which contains 3, 4, 5, and 9. So notice that there's no elements common between, uh, between those two sets. And so the A union B is just equal to all the elements in those two sets. 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9, and 12. And if you count up those, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8 total in A union B. And of course we can see that the number of elements in the union is equal to the number of elements that we had in A plus the number of elements that we had in B. Or in this case, just 4 plus 4. Now if we have any type of set, or any type of sets, we don't know whether they're disjoint or not. We'll assume in this case that, that there might be some overlap in them down here. If we look at the number of elements in A union B, then if we just take the number of elements in A plus the number of elements in B, if we look at it, we're taking the number of elements in A and then the number of elements in B, you'll notice that that middle part there would get counted twice. And so we don't want that. We only want to count each of these three sections once. And so if that one gets counted twice, in order to get an accurate number, we need to subtract off that, that middle part that we counted twice. And so we're left with this property here that the number of elements in A union B is equal to the number of elements in A plus the number of elements in B minus the intersection, the number of elements in the intersection. Now I've got another quick example here with two sets A and B and we notice that there are two numbers common between those two sets 5 and 7. So when we do the union between those two sets we get 2, 3, 5, 7, 8, and 9. And therefore the, the number of elements in the union is 6. The number of elements in the intersection is 2, of course, those two numbers, 5 and 7. And so the number of elements in A union B would be the number of elements in A, which was 4, plus the number of elements in B, which was again 4, minus that intersection, which was 2, and that gives us our 6 that we were expecting. Now let's look at something we call product sets. A product set is labeled with this label right here where we say A cross B and the elements of A cross B are basically ordered pairs. So in this case order matters. A and B are the elements of that of that pair that we have right here. So this this indicates what a element of the product set looks like A comma B and the little the lowercase a is in our first set capital A and our and B is in our second set capital B and so the cross product set just consists of all of those ordered pairs where we take the first from A and the second from B and notice that since they're ordered if we happen to have the same or if we have if the same elements in A and B if we had A and B then that would be a different element from B comma A. So order order matters in this case. 
So let's look at an example where we can make a, a cross product set. We have two sets here, A and B, and we're going to make the cross product set A cross B. To do that, we're going to take one element from A and one element from B and make an ordered pair. So to start with, I would take the first element of A and then go through all of the elements of B, then take the next element of A and again go through all the elements of B and so on. So in this case I start with 4 and then I get the two elements from B, so 4 in D and 4 in E. That'll be our, our first two elements of our cross product set. Then I would take our second element from A and then the two elements from B. So it would be 5 in D and 5 in E. So our cross product set would end up being equal to those four elements. Now how do we count the elements in a cross product set? Well, we'll assume again that they're finite. there's a finite number of elements in both A and B. And in this case, the, the number of elements in the cross product set will just be equal to the number of elements in A times the number of elements in B. So notice that in this example that we had above, we had two elements in A and two elements in B. And so if we multiply those, we get four. And indeed, we had four elements in the cross product set A cross B. Another example of a cross product set is, is binary numbers. You've probably worked with binary numbers before. The set that we're dealing with is just the numbers 0 and 1. So A is just 0 and 1. And to get binary numbers, we just do a cross pro continue cross products of A. So if we wanted 3-bit binary numbers, we would have A cross A cross A. And as you know, we can generate the numbers of the bi or the binary numbers of that set, and there were they would be ordered pairs, or, or ordered triplets, I guess in this case. Now notice that order matters because zero one one is different than one one zero, so they're they're different elements. So order matters in this case, and as you know, with three bit binary numbers, the number of of binary numbers that we can have with three bits is 2 to the 3, 2 to 2 raised to the power of 3, or 8 in this case. Now let's look at partitions of sets, or partitions of our universal set. We're assuming here that our universal set U is non empty, meaning it has some elements in it. A partition subdivides that universal set into non-empty subsets. So all of these subsets have to have some elements in them. And in this case we're going to say we have capital N subsets. So we'll label those subsets A1, A2, and so on through AN. Now the properties that these subsets have is that they're all mutually disjoint. Meaning that if, if we take any two different subsets and we look at the intersection between them, that'll be an empty set. In other words, they don't have any elements in common. So that's true for any two sets that we pick where we're not picking the same sub same set to do this analysis. So we would pick A1 and A2 and compare them and there would be nothing in common. Also, all of these subsets, when we union them, give us back the universal set. So all of the elements in our universal set are somewhere in those subsets A1 through AN. And you can think of, here's a Venn diagram, you can think of it as just subdividing up that whole Venn diagram into these different subsets. Here's an example. I've, I've got the universal set a, B, C, D, E, and we want to know which one of the following s groups of sets are partitions. So we get the, let's take a look at them one by one. The first one, we've got three s sets. Notice that if we did the union of all these, we would have A, B, C, D, E, which would give us all of those. Also, they, we don't have any empty sets 
and if we take the the or if we look at them individually or two of them together they're all dis they're completely disjoint or they're uh, mutually disjoint so this one and this one are, don't have anything in common this one and this one have nothing in common and this one and this one have nothing in common so they're they are mutually disjoint and the union of all of them give us our universal set so yes that one is a a partition now let's look at the second one we only have one set but notice that it if, if we take that one set we do get our universal set there aren't any other sets so that it is disjoint with any other set so that is a valid partition now let's look at the, th the third one you can see right away that there's only four elements there and so if we union them we don't get our un universal set back and therefore that is not a partition and the last one we have three sets however if we did the union of them we would get our universal set back however notice that the first set and the second set or the third set have an element in common B and so they are not mutually disjoint sets therefore that is not a valid partition alright so let's look at one more example of partitions in this case we're going to find all the possible partitions of our universal set so our universal set is here it has three elements in it X Y and Z and we're going to find all the the possible partitions well like we saw in the previous example if we have one set with all the elements in it that is a valid partition so we would start with one a set with all the elements in it also we can make a set with just with each sorry we can make a group of sets where each set has just one element each in each of those sets and we cover all of the elements of our universal set and then the following sets are basically just two sets with one element in one set and two elements in the other sets and you can see that there's three different combinations of doing that so x y z y x z and z x y and those are our, our all of the possible partitions for this particular universal set of course if you have more elements in your universal set you're going to end up with more possibilities for partitions.